Hello. Hello, how you doing? Fine, thank you. Oh, you're back at the old place again. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, well we don't have a problem there with sound, right? Yeah, yeah, sound is fine. What are, you, what are you using, a webcam for a camera? Yeah. That's all, huh? Yeah, that's all. Wow, it's amazing. It really is. And, and, and you use various microphones, right? Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It really is amazing. But really what counts is the PowerPoint. We see the PowerPoint great. You know, you don't need a good camera for that. Yeah. Because we are doing a, a screenshot. That's it. I'm sorry? Because we are sharing the screen. That, that's it. Oh, okay. Yeah, if anyone else wants to broadcast, let me know, okay? Okay, I will, I will. The other Jordan, Jordanian doctors, if they want to broadcast, that, 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 that's fine. Yeah, if they want, that's okay. Okay. Uh, okay, John, I will text you before we start. Okay. Oh, we have some panelists here. Dr. Habib, how are you today? And Dr. Kanan, are you there? Can you guys hear me okay? I'll unmute you, Tariq. We haven't started yet, Tariq and uh, Ali. Are you there, Ali? Ali, you there? Yeah, you don't have to talk if you don't want to talk. That's okay. But if you want to talk, we're here, okay? Generally, the procedure, what we do is Dr. Uh, Abraham presents, and then after the presentation, if you gentlemen want to ask him a question, you can do that, okay? And you can meet Dr. Abraham, which is, which is a great opportunity. I don't know if you guys are residents or uh, endings, but... Irregardless, he's a good guy to meet.
Hello? Yes, hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Who is Fantastic. speaking? Who is I'm speaking? Tarek. Tarek Kanaan. Oh, Tarek Kanaan. How are you doing today? Fine, thank you. Uh, we haven't started. We won't start for a few minutes, about 10 minutes. Yeah, great. I'm actually in the operating theater, so. Okay. <laughs> well, okay, you're welcome. Time. You're welcome to watch. <laughs> I'm I'm watching. Okay. Uh, it's it's really uh, very practical. Well, if you have any presentations you'd like to give online, let me know. We could you could do it if you wanted. Absolutely. Yeah, or any of your associates. Okay, I've got to go. Yeah. I'll be I'll be I'll be back. Oh, oh, Dr. Dr. Kanan, after the presentation, you can ask Dr. Abraham questions face to face. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If you're still around. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. دكتور علي حبيب Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, do you guys hear me? Yeah, yes, we do. Okay. 
Uh, actually, I'm uh, not very familiar with this application, but I always uh, saw your uh, post at uh, Facebook. So I, oh, I, I thought, why not? But hey, that's hey, you only live once. <laughs> hey, I'll be with you in a second. I'm just doing some last minute promotion here myself. Yeah, yeah sure. On sure. Facebook. Okay. As we speak. Okay, okay, okay. Well, uh, it is very good seeing you. Thank you. Like you're welcome, that. You're welcome to come to any of them. Any, uh, any, any of them. Thank you very much. Doctor Ali Habib, give me a mic. Alhamdulillah. But I'm not very... Excuse me? I'm from Pakistan. Thank you. Oh, we're televising for three days from Pakistan, starting tomorrow morning at 8. Yeah, I, I saw that. Yeah, the Spine Conference. The Spine Conference in Kar Karachi. Yes, yes. Good. Especially, are you a resident? Yes, I am a resident. Okay, well, that third day, they have a, a neuros neurosurgery boot camp. It's designed for residents. Mm -hmm. It's a good, it looks okay. good. So check it out. I, I would surely. Thank you very much. Okay. This Christian, okay, Christos. Yeah, as I, uh, I'll wait till Tariq comes. There's another person coming in here, Christos. <clears throat> Hello, Christos. Christos, can you hear me? He's just getting set up. Ali, Habib, uh, Anas, I saw you online there. Uh, <clears throat> Generally, as I, to as I told Tariq uh, Kanan, what Dr. Abraham usually presents for about 45 minutes, and then after that, he'll, he'll answer questions from the audience, and then he'll come online to talk to you guys and I, if you have any questions or comments. So, and during the conference, please stay muted. Christos, can you hear me okay? You're muted now, Christos. <laughs> Hi, Chris. How are you doing now? I, is this, who am I speaking? Is Ali? Is this Ali? I can't see the pictures. Hi, Chris. I, I can see you there. I can see your microphone, but you're, you're muted. There you go. Chris, can you hear me? Okay, at any rate, anyway, we'll be starting in a few. <clears throat> That's his assistant setting up. Tariq, I want to show you Florida, okay? I'm going to turn it my will camera. Be my pleasure. I'm turning my camera around. Let me see if you can see it here. Let me see. I'm trying to get my camera to. Okay, let me take off the. Hold on. 
Let me take off this background first. Okay, there we go. You can see the palm tree, right? I'm in South Beach, South Miami Beach, off, off, off the ocean. I cannot see. I, oh, now yes. I can't. You can't see it too well. Now, now I can see. Oh, wonderful! There's a palm tree right out my window. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's a nice place to work. Have you ever been here? <laughs> I've been to the East Coast. Yes, to New York, Michigan, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, Washington D.C. Yes, yeah, but that was a long, long time ago. It's too cold up there for me. Yeah. I lived in Germany for 10 years, so I love the oh, cold Oh, you like weather. the cold, huh? Oh, that's good. Absolutely. Which I love part? It. Wow, that's great. That's great. Where are you now, Tariq? I'm in Amman at oh. Jordan University Hospital. Oh, good. Oh, go Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, but sadly, I couldn't uh, attend the, the, the um, weekly meeting of Dr. Brahim today. Because it's my uh, operating day. Oh, okay. Okay, every Wednesday? Every Wednesday. Oh, okay. One day a week or more? Actually more. It's um, Thursday, Wednesday, and sometimes uh, Tuesdays. Okay. That's your schedule. But, That's your schedule, right? Uh, absolutely. So uh, Sunday and Monday, we have the major clinics and three days a week operating theater you don't you don't cover trauma anymore right of course we do oh well i mean uh, uh, as an attending the residents see them first right uh, yeah of course of course yeah, yeah. yeah. but yeah, i mean they do most of the work uh in the uh on call or on the on calls but it's very rare that we uh, have to attend at night no oh okay uh, all the scheduled surgeries Okay. Amman looks beautiful. I'd like to someday to go there. You are more than welcome. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I can't, can't believe the ruins they have there and the theater they have there. Incredible. Who's crying in the back sound? Oh, okay. Uh, well, okay. I, I can usually mute everybody here. Uh, I guess Ali, maybe. Maybe we, yeah, I usually mute uh, everyone when they start. But um, uh, anyways, yeah, I, I grew up around New York and I'm, I'm, I used to like the cold weather. I used, like you, I used to enjoy it. They used to feel invigorated. But yep. that, being in Miami for 20 years and, and then when I went back, wow, my body had changed totally. Didn't like it. I think if I never yeah. came to Florida, I would, I would still like it. So. Yes. Uh, how about the humidity in Florida? Yeah, it, it certain months. Yeah, it, around yeah June, July, August. That's yeah, it gets pretty. But you know, that's you just get used to it. Once you're here for a while, you don't really feel it as much. When I first got here, I sweated like crazy. From from walking to the from the apartment to the car, I was drenched in sweat. It was so hot. I don't know if you've been to an area like that, but uh, now that I do, hardly sweat in, in the hot weather. So your body changes. There's physiological changes for sure. Absolutely, You're absolutely right. And yeah, it's uh, I feel comfortable in the warm weather. I don't like it when it gets a, just a little cold here in, in 60 degrees which is warm in other parts of the country, but to me, it's cold. <laughs> and it's funny. Yeah, yeah hold on. Let me... Uh, we'll be starting in a few. It's good to see all you guys in the panel. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Khair. Good evening. My name is Ibrahim Sreh. I'm a neurosurgeon, and we are transmitting live to our international audience from the Farah Medical Campus here in Amman, Jordan. Uh, the topic for tonight is going to be recurrent craniopharyngiomas. We spoke about craniopharyngiomas in the past. Now we will concentrate on recurrence. And this is a picture of these ugly tumors. The uh, pituitary gland, when it forms, it forms from a process that comes from the, from the pharynx, another process that comes from the brain. They meet together and they form the pituitary gland. So we have a process from the pharynx and the cranium. That's why it's called craniopharyngeum. That happens in the uh, six weeks of gestation. So here they are, they are meeting, they form the anterior pituitary. Anterior pituitary comes from the, uh, the pharynx part, and this comes, the neural hypothesis comes from the brain part. And this meeting here, the patch, if it persists, it can form craniopharyngeum. So the craniopharyngeum can be within the cellar, the cellar, supracellular, or completely within the third ventricle. So here we are, cellar, five to 10 percent. The supracellular is the majority, 80 to 85. So here it is just occupying the cellar, supracellular, pushing the chiasm up, or here it's going above the chiasm, or here it is going imaginating the floor of the third ventricle. Here is completely within the third ventricle. So 5%, 5%, and about 90% is the supracellular part. Uh, to deal with these lesions, you have to be absolutely sure about the anatomical knowledge. It is a crime for any neurosurgeon or resident to go there if he doesn't have the full knowledge of every structure there. And I usually ask how many of our neurosurgeons and our residents know this anatomy? The answer is extremely very few. So all this relationship with the pituitary gland, with the carotids, with the pituitary cerebral, the third uh, kilometer nerve, and the anterior communicating complex is very essential. And also another essential is you know, the anatomy of the third ventricle, which is made of a roof, zero wall, floor, and then zero wall. So this is the anterior wall, which is the lamina terminalis. The roof is made by the body of the fornix. Underneath it is the choroid plexus and the internal cerebral veins. The visceral wall is made of this structure here, the junction of the internal cerebral veins to the vein of gallin, and the bottom is the pineal gland. And the lateral wall of the third ventricle Part of it is related to the thalamus, and part of it is related to the hypothalamus. The floor is the hypothalamus, made of uh, many structures, but here we can see the mammillary body, bodies. And this hypothalamus, as we said, it's the five grams that control the essence of our life. Just five grams of brain tissue controls you fully from the time of birth, from the time of development in utero, till you die. This is the responsibility of the hypothalamus. So it gained great importance to know the uh, nuclei within the uh, hypothalamus, and we found that they are arranged in the groups, medial group and lateral group, and from anterior to posterior, anterior, medial and posterior group. And each nucleus, what it is responsible for. This physiological knowledge is mandatory for anybody operating in that area. And another structure that needs to be addressed is the liliquist membrane, which is made of the diencephalic leaf and the 
using Kifalik and Leaf. So any legion within the that area, of course, may uh, have a uh, last um, differential diagnosis. These are clinical endurances. These are all my cases. You can see we have the cellular supercellular But also we have to address that there, you will have particular diagnosis, especially if you have listed like these cases of mine. Or uh, that case of pouch, which is the same like a cranial endoma. Yes, they have the same developmental uh, changes. They have the same developmental basis. Meningiomas in the supracellular area. Again, these are my cases. Cellular meningioma, supracellular meningioma. Epidermoid in that area. Looks like physically apoplexy or looks like a cranial endoma. Why should we know this? Yes, we just operate on these lesions and then find out. Wrong. You have to know them before you operate so that you are prepared of what to do, what are the expectations. You tell the patient, the relatives, what are the outcome, what's the prognosis. But people do not want to know. They just want to operate with little knowledge and they just take a biopsy and send for radiotherapy. One case of mine also is the hypothalamic hamartomas. I will think we'll, we'll address this in another future lecture. Germinomas, histocytic sarcoma, teratoma, histocytosis of the cellular, the largest optic glioma in literature, it's mine, astrocytoma, lymphoma, cordoma, plasmacytoma, cyanonasal carcinoma, metastasis, sarcoidosis, aneurysm in that area, all these, they are included in the differential diagnosis. And they should be thought, and they should be in your mind whenever you see a patient like this. Osteoma, choroid plexus fibroma, which we presented last time, oligodendroglioma, arachnoid cysts, anesthesia of neuroblastoma. So it's a wide differential diagnosis. Uh, Dr. Hadid, did you want to comment? Do we have just to comment about the, the differential diagnosis? Yeah. Yes. About the image. The, the, the cranial pharyngioma has a variable imaging. You can't, but you have to remember it has two types the adamantibotus type and the papilla. The adamantibotus type it is A. You give it A grades 90% calcified, 90% cystic, 90% enhances. Okay, this is usually comes in early age group. <laughs> While the papillary, it is rarely calcified. Most the solid, it is enhancing. As we said, diffusion restriction, there is no diffusion restriction on the cranial pharyngeal, but it is, it is benign. Thank you. The word benign in neurosurgery does not mean much. It's histological definition. But a benign cranial pharyngeal being situated in this malignant situation, is very difficult. Any other radiology comment? Okay. What's the management of these? Three different modalities available. Either you do the surgery or you treat them with radionuclides, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and conventional radiotherapy or radiosurgery. These are the modalities that we have in hand. Whatever the mode of treatment, be it by radiation or by surgery or by whatever it needs, dedicated team. Neurosurgeon, anesthetist, immunologist, endocrinologist, ophthalmologist, and neuroradiologist, and neuropathologist, and radiation oncologist. Last time, and I think in, we presented this case downstairs, Dr. Hamad Juma told you about the management of DI in these patients, and Dr. Abu Aishid also described the anesthetic risks of these patients. It needs common knowledge. We are one uh, chain and we help each other. Surgery, various routes, transcortical, transcalosal, subfrontal, frontotemporal, transbasal, transpetrosal, transrenoidal, and so on. Of course, that's surgery and that's endoscopy. Surgery, two groups of people the good ones and the not good ones. 
The good ones believe in radical resection. The not good ones believe in partial resection and radiotherapy. I do not subscribe to this. I subscribe to this because this is less recurrence, less procedures, and good quality of life. Here, higher recurrence, multiple procedures, complications of radiation, quality of life is poor. So it is the state of mind when you operate on these patients. Before you start surgery, am I going to do radical extension or partial extension? Those good people, they would go for radical. Those not good people will go for biopsy and radiotherapy. There is always a border that can be identified. Most of the time, 99%. So the traditional teaching to the residents by their mentors is wrong. It's a crime to tell the residents that these, patients, these tumors cannot be removed. Don't try, they cannot be removed. This belongs to the medieval ages. And your surgical experience has an impact on the extent of resection. If you are a good surgeon, you will achieve good excision. It's, it's a very simple formula. Good surgeons do radical excision. Is it me that I'm saying this? No. If you re recording this uh, session, you can magnify these and see the names of the great, great giants who are doing radical excision of these tumors. I'm not gonna dwell on that, but just to tell you that there are so many good neurosurgeons that are doing the right thing and very few uh, mediocre surgeons that they are doing the crimes. Let's just go through them. Harold Hoffman is recognized as the founder of pediatric neurosurgery in the world. He is from the University of Toronto. 1977, radical excision of the cranial pharyngeum. 1977, they did not have the advantage of MRI, they did not have the advantage of anything, but they realized this. 1990, Hamad Razi Ezergil, the man of century of neurosurgeon, of neurosurgery radical excision in 144 patients. Of course, as I said, he's, he's a friend of, of ours. 1994, this is mentioned in all books. We advocate radical resection as the optional treatment in all patients, pediatric or others, especially for children, because you don't want to radiate a child. And listen to this, incomplete resection is a virtual guarantee of recurrence, 100%. Is it only to the Western world? No, Japan, 2005. This man from Japan says, I do first surgery, if they recur, I do second surgery, I do third surgery, not for radiotherapy, because you are in a very important structure, which is the hypothalamus and the optic apparatus in a child. Argentina, 2005, radical resection of the cranial pharyngeum. Oh, it's big, it's adherent, nonsense. This teaching must stop. Those mediocre mentors, they should disappear from our world, telling the residents that it is impossible to remove the cranial pharyngeum. USA, 2005, total resection proved the best outcome. What happened to the hypothalamus? Oh, you will damage the hypothalamus. Nonsense. You will damage the hypothalamus by giving radiation, by keeping the tumor there. Samuel Mifti, giant of a neurosurgeon, Syrian living in the States, total removal, 2007. Look at this size. Christian St. John, St. Rose, uh, French, was also a leading uh, pediatric neurosurgeon. The best overall results is achieved by complete resection by experienced craniofaryngeal surgeons. If he cannot, then subtotal resection followed by radiotherapy. But he is experienced. He is going there with a the state of mind, I want to remove every ion of this. If this experienced surgeon failed when he is trying to remove it completely, you have to accept defeat and then do subtotal resection and radiotherapy. Efficacy and safety, safety of radical resection, USA 2007. 
my whistle. Uh, another giant of uh, craniform Juma is Farbusch, Rudolf Farbusch from Erlangen uh, in Germany. Complete craniform Juma resection with acceptable morbidity can be obtained in 80 to 90% of cases. These are giants of people, not me eating and being this. China, 2008, radical resection. China, 2008 again, radical resection. And then comes this paper by Pascal from Argentina. He's a close friend of mine, and we always, in the same session on cranial he produced this paper. He says, the tumor would displace the mammillary bodies. So when you remove it completely, you will not damage the mineral bodies and you will not damage the hypothalamus. So that was a real tool showing how the mineral bodies would move. So by doing radical excision, you take the tumor out of this brain, keep it healthy, and you don't subject the patient to radiation. Question from Korea 2015. Is complete resection feasible? The answer is, Yes, yes. You can achieve total radical excision. You just need to know anatomy, pathology, physiology. Go and train yourself. Those people who do not want to learn, those who are people who finish the board and they just go for service, they would never do a good case of clinical job. And their monitors also. Majid Sami, giant of neurosurgery from Hanover. 65 cases of giant, giant craniopharyngioma, gross total resection in majority of them. Another giant of pituitary craniopharyngioma is Ed Laws from Harvard. He's now in Harvard, actually. He was the president of the World Federation and the president of the American Surgeons. And what he says, unfortunately, non-surgical options have provided limited benefits while incurring their own risks. Non-surgical options should be reserved as adjuvant therapy following surgical management. The best long-term outcome is reported following cross tooth resection. Don't believe me, believe him. Mayo Clinic, 2018. Cranial pharyngioma as a primer for the skull based surgeon. It is in the domain of a good neurosurgeon to do radical excision. Asian Neuro Journal, Neurosurgical Journal 2018, uh, radical resection. So don't listen to those mediocre surgeons, those mediocre mentors, and those me 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 mediocre uh, residents. Mayo Clinic, maximum safe, safe resection by microscopy or endoscopy provides very good tumor control. What do we see in terms of bad practice in surgery? is the insertion of my reservoir. This is still practiced every day in Jordan and the Arab world and the Islamic world and the third world country. This is a crime. It has finished long time ago. Nobody uses my reservoir yet. The mentors teach their residents. This is the way to do it because it's easy. Who is Umayya? Umayya is a Pakistani neurosurgeon who Immigrated to the United States. He was actually in Oxford and then he went to the United States. And in 1965, he was working in the States and they were wondering how to put some chemotherapeutic agents into the ventricles for the uh, cancer patients. And he came up with this tube. You put it in the ventricle, you inject the antibiotic or the uh, chemotherapy or whatever into the ventricle. So when he invented it, he invented for access to the ventricles. It turned out to be the only weapon in the hands of mediocre surgeons. Look at this. What would you do with this? Oh, we evacuate the cysts every week. Look at this. And this paper from Brazil, cortical seeding of a cranial pharyngioma across. Look at this. It's seeded. Intracranial ectopic recurrence of cranial pharyngioma after my reservoir. This is the, the thing, and this is the my result. You have done nothing. And you go and bring the patient to and fro, and the tube is blocked, and meningitis, and so on. And they live with it. I don't know how they live with it. 
look, listen to this. Mayo Clinic, I hope you will believe this. Omaya Reservoir is a palliative and it is used in resistant cases only and should never be considered as a first line of treatment. Never. <clears throat> Another bad practice. Craniopharyngioma causing hydrocephalus. What's the treatment? Shunt. Because shunt is the first surgery that the resident in the Arab world, indeed, underdeveloped world, knows. So he has to do shunt. It is the only surgery he can do. Bear holds, what's a dural? A disc, screw for fixation. These are the four surgeries that they can do. And they remain all their lives depending on these four cases. Shunt, look at this. What is shunt going to do? It's wrong shunt, wrong path. Look. Very bad practice bilateral. Why? Because the craniopharyngioma has blocked both ventricles. So what they do? Bilateral shunt. And we put YouTube, UI connection, and that's it. And send for radiotherapy. Look at this. Whenever there is a preoperative MRI, they usually produce postoperative CT scan, never postoperative MRI. And they call this recurrence. Is this recurrence? This is incomplete excision. But this is called recurrence, even by a radiologist. A patient had previous surgery, now he has recurrence. It is not recurrence. Tell the world the truth. Tell that this surgeon is bad, he's a mediocre. This is a tumor as it was, and no, no more. The other, surgery, the other mode of treatment is by endoscopy. And look at these pictures by endoscopy. Endoscopy is the future of a neurosurgeon. It gives you information. It actually taught me personally a new anatomy. This is the chiasm as seen from below, from the nose. Chiasm, optic nerve on the left, optic nerve on the right, the pituitary stroke, the blood vessels, the inferior hypophysial artery, sphemophysial artery, anterior communicating complex, beautiful anatomy. Optic chiasm, pituitary stroke. Again, look at the anatomy here. And here, accession of craniopharyngioma by endoscopy. This is the inside of the third ventricle. And this is how it goes. 2007, approaches of craniopharyngioma. This was done by Enrico De Vitis and uh, Paolo Carabianca from Italy. They are the giants of uh, endoscopy, endosurgical endoscopy. Amin Kassam from uh, Pittsburgh, uh, again, made this classification according to the uh, findings of endoscopy. Another paper from Gardner and Snyderman from School of Medicine of Pittsburgh, so Pennsylvania. You can see the before and after, before and after via endoscopy. So whether you are doing it microsurgery or doing it endoscopy, the aim is radical excision. Italy 2004, this is uh, Giorgio Frank, again from uh, Italy. We served together in one of the committees of the World Federation. He's a great endoscopist. Fred Gentili, my friend from Toronto. <coughs> he can actually do it microsurgical and endo endoscopy. Uh, he's a great man. And you can see the results. <clears throat> the other mode of treatment is the intracystic radionucleotides, bleomycin, yttrium, neuron, B emitting radionucleotide, B32, rhenium, interferon, etc. Are they good? No. And this is a final statement in this paper by Winky in 2012. He says, his group says, searching the multiple databases, relevant articles, so databases articles, reviews, conference proceedings, ongoing trial databases, we are unable to promote treatment with intracystic bleomycin in children, period. Still people still using it. Oh, interferon, a new thing, let's use it. There you are. What's the result? The tumor is still there. After three years, the two years of treatment. Another paper from Japan about the intracystic things. Look at this, and two months later, what have you achieved? Disaster. 
from China. They speak to you about the uh, uh, treatment with phosphorus 32 and how many times the treatment? Once, twice, thrice, four times. The leak of the medicine outside, meningitis, brain damage, you know it. And this is another statement. This radionuclide should not be given for any patient expected to go for surgery. Because if you give and then refer for surgery, surgery is not going to work at all. What about radiotherapy? Radiotherapy or radiosurgery, the same. They have their own complications. And this is a picture of one patient of mine whom I re operated removing his uh, craniopharyngioma for good reason or for bad reason. Somebody in his own country gave him radiotherapy and you can see the necrosis, temporal necrosis and brainstem necrosis. We're talking about child. Types of radiotherapy, external beam radiation. This is the abbreviation. Conform conformal 3D radiotherapy. Intensity modulated radiotherapy, IMRT. Proton beam radiotherapy. Stereotactic radiosurgery and brachytherapy. Now the same, radiotherapy. So the, to speak about stereotactic radiosurgery is wrong. This is stereotactic radiotherapy. It has nothing to do with surgery. And those people doing it are not surgeons. So radiotherapy or, or radiosurgery carry this uh, vast risk. But it's useful to use it in cases when you have failed. And this is really the end of it, the end of the line. Harvard 2006, using combined methods of radiation to treat these craniopharyngiomas. Usually they are uh, recurrent after many surgeries. And uh, another paper treated by radiotherapy, uh, 97 patients. And this paper, I think, comes from Memphis, Tennessee, in this period of time. And these are the, the list of the patients. Another paper about proton beam therapy uh, from Texas, in Houston. And they could not find any difference between their various methods. Another paper from USA using dosimetric uh, kind of uh, uh, assessment between MRT or proton beam and uh, MRT radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. And the treatment is. Uh, almost the same. Advances the management of clinical angioma by radiation. So radiation is developing, but it is not the first line of treatment. It is the not the main line of treatment. It comes third, fourth, fifth line of treatment. Gamma knife, story of the gamma knife, which I am never uh, gonna stop until people realize what's happening. This is from Charlottesville, Virginia. And it's one of the major uh, radiosurgery centers in the world, in America. Steiner was there, Laszlo Steiner, uh, God bless his soul. He started all this, he was a very good man. And uh, these people are treating this with gamma knife. They forgot that gamma knife should not be used in any tumor which is adherent to the optic apparatus. They just forgot about this. And I always refer to my lecture here when we brought the gamma knife, so I know what the gamma knife is. <clears throat> Limitations are variable, and we discussed the malignancy last time. Still, people are using the stereotactic radiosurgery. It said to be called stereotactic radiotherapy, not radiosurgery. There is no surgery in it. One year. One year after, what's the difference? Oh, we have controlled the tumor. They say, control. What do you mean by control? Gamma knife, 2012, 98 patients. Look at the difference before and after control. So when this, and this is the topic for tonight, when these uh, tumors recur, they can recur on the same side or they can on the other side. But remember, recurrence, you should have had complete resection proven on MRI before you say it's recurrence. So stop saying recurrent when it is actually residual and incomplete surgery by mediocre surgeons. But also they can occur in other sites far away from site of surgery. Uh, this paper, also a topic, 
recurrent. I choose to put this uh, as the first paper on these recurrences, 2019. This is published in World of Neurosurgery recently uh, from China. And they speak about this, see, craniopharyngioma, and then this is the recurrence in the temporal area. So this is original, this is the seedling or recurrence. And they have put a long list of recurrences. This is the, the cases and these are the authors. Again, anybody who is recording this can see for themselves that this is true. And they can occur anywhere, frontal lobe, cerebral fissure, cerebral levantine angle, prepontine, interhemispheric, everywhere. From South Korea, this tumor removed it. Look what is the recurrence. So this is the true word of recurrence. They have removed it. This is the evidence and it recurs. But if you see this as a pre-op and see that there's still a tumor there, this is not recurrence. Another ectopic, again from the group of Ali Krisht and Little Rock, Arkansas. And you can see what is the uh, seedling. Brainstem, the thalamus, everywhere. Ali is from Lebanon, he works in Little Rock. From Germany, this tumor, and this is the recurrence. Finland, this is the tumor removed. This is the recurrence. Sweden, nine years after surgery, there is a frontal recurrence, frontal temporal. Another paper in the Journal of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology from USA, 17 years after the initial presentation. That calls for a close follow-up. You have to follow every case of brain tumors for many, many years. Every brain tumor of mine must have a brain MRI immediately after surgery, every three months for one year, every two, six months for two years, and then every year thereafter. This tells you this, 17 years after the initial presentation, they have recurrence. Subgaleal, subgaleal recurrence. And this paper, 2014, tumor, and the recurrence. Recurrence in cerebral fissures from USA. Recurrence from Spain. Impact of a tumor topography. Very beautiful paper telling you the relationship of the optic chiasm with the tumor and the anterior complex in relation to would you be able to remove the tumor completely or not? like the uh, paper of Pascal. Again, ectopic recurrence of cranial pharyngioma along the surgical tract. We have removed it, secured along the tract. From China, ectopic recurrence, frontal, and a brainstorm. Early ectopic recurrence of cranial pharyngioma, CP angle. Recurrence, frontal. So what is the histology of these recurrent cases? Are they the same like fresh cranial pharyngiomas? For this, Dr. Hassan of Hussain will tell you uh, if there is any difference between the fresh cases or the current cases. Assalamu alaikum. And, and this is uh, one of the recurrent gross cases. You can see they are in multiple cystic areas and solid areas. Uh, <clears throat> and this is the squamous part of the craniopharyngioma. You can see the craniopharyngioma that is adamantomatous type, usually have many wet uh, bodies, we call them. Uh, this is the basal layer, and this is the stellate reticulum, and this is the superficial layer. And this is brain tissue or gliosis around, around it. Uh, the recurrent cases we found, they are actually many gliosis, more gliosis, because it's obvious because they are recurring in glial tissue. <clears throat> we can see again the higher power. Uh, this is the basal layer, and it's different from the stellate reticulum and from the superficial layer and with uh, 
uh, keratin. And uh, we believe these are different, actually. You can see uh, craniofarjoma uh, has uh, um, a lot of calcification, as in this case. This is calcification. Sometimes you can have foreign body giant cell reaction secondary to the keratin. <clears throat> And uh, this is the basal layer with keratin and the superficial layer. Again, you can see calcification, and this is the uh, foreign body giant cell reaction surrounding the calcified areas. This is uh, part of the with keratin areas. This is the stellate reticulum. So squamous cells actually they have four different patterns in a craniopharyngioma. Again, this is the calcified areas with foreign body giant cell reaction with the gliosis. A lot of gliosis uh, in this case. Uh, this is not, this is HND. This is uh, uh, again. You can see in, you know, there is a, 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 a what keratin and uh, basal layer singles and uh, select reticulum. This is one of the immune staining. I think uh, this is cytokeratin 19. You can see cytokeratin 19 always. Always, we found it uh, strongly positive in all layers of craniopharyngioma, the stellate reticulum, except the wet keratin is negative. The basal layer, stellate reticulum, and the uh, uh, superficial layer. And we found cytokeratin 19 positive in all uh, cystic lesions in the brain. And this is really was very interesting, and we uh, had an abstract on this one. Uh, this is cytokeratin 19. You can see it positive in the basal layer, positive in the stellate reticulum and positive in the superficial layer. So it's positive in all layers. And I mentioned to you earlier that cytokeratin-19 uh, is really one of the uh, very early cytokeratins that are present in the intermediate, uh, uh, the interim cells in the embryo, in the squamous cells. So probably this is why I explained it's present in all the cystic lesions, probably because they have some congenital uh, etiology in this. Epithelium membrane antigen and the contrary is not present in all layers. It's present on the surface layer and uh, in the wet keratin, but it's not present in the stellate reticulum or in the basal layer. Although it's epithelium called epithelial membrane antigen, but it's not present in all epithelial areas. Again, you can see epithelial membrane antigen, how uh, very beautifully uh, illustrated in the luminal area and in the wet keratin, but it's negative in the stellate reticulum and in the basal layer. Uh, GFAB, as uh, it's a stain for the gliosis or brain tissue, is very strongly positive in between the squamous cells. You can see the gliosis is very prominent. This is the area of the gliosis and in between squamous cells. And this is probably what characterizes the recurrent cases that they have more gliosis surrounding them. Uh, high molecular weight cytokeratin, uh, it's present uh, in all layers uh, of the squamous, except in the wet keratin, as you could see. Uh, by the way, you, you mentioned, you, you can see that I discriminate between the four layers of uh, cyto, uh, squamous layers uh, because we really did a big study and we published this, uh, we presented in Orlando Cab uh, College of American Pathologists in 2013. And also we published this, me and Dr. Brahim Spiech will show you later. Uh, because we, it, it's, it's obvious that uh, the cytokeratin or, or the lay, different layers of uh, craniofrangioma they really have different uh, pathogenesis and etiologies, and it, they are not all the same. And that's why probably, for like, example, wet keratin is not present in papillary type in uh, craniopharyngioma. It's only present in the uh, uh, adamantomatous type. Low molecular weight cytokeratin is present in the stellate reticulum. You can see it's negative in the uh, basal layer. B63, it's a squamous marker. Sometimes it's negative, but sometimes it's positive. Here, here you can see a positivity in the most in the stellate reticulum and in the basal layer. K67 usually is low in uh, craniofarynchomas, even in the recurrent cases. So K67 really does not indicate much of a prognostic value. You can see some positivity. Usually it's less than one person, but uh, we do it because we it's routine to do in all brain tumors, but it doesn't really. Uh, help in differentiating whether this count to recur or not. Uh, this is the paper that we really published, uh, me and Dr. Ibrahim Smeh, uh, in International Clinical Pathology Journal, about different 
uh, keratin uh, or different, different epithelial markers that are present in different layers of the squamous uh, uh, cells. And not every squamous marker will be positive in different uh, craniopharyngioma, and it probably will help uh, in the uh, pathogenesis and etiology of these cases, and maybe in the future will help in predicting some recurrences uh, if somebody wants to study it further. This is the paper. And this is the abstract that we uh, uh, posted that we presented in, in 2013 in College of American Pathologists. Thank you. Again, here you can see. <coughs> Please come on. Can you, how can you explain what ectopic dissemination? Is it is it by spreading through of cancer cells or tumorous cells through blood vessels to the ectopic uh, place? No, it's and if it is the case, do you expect you know, to find? Ectopic tissue and other, uh, not oh, in the brain, no. skeletal. Uh, sure. All the uh, distant uh, seedlings were along the CSF pathways. So, whenever any tumor, benign or malignant, comes in touch with the CSF, then it can metastasize into the subarachnoid space, into the posterior fossil nuclei. So, there is no metastasis outside the brain from cranial injuries. It is through the CSF. Any comment? Or mm -hmm. any? Please. Can be the cranial pheromone can be outside the cranial cavity. The cranial pheromone can be outside the cavity. It can be in the paranasal sinuses, and it can be in the nasopharynx. Because it goes again through the CSF, through the endonasal. Uh, so the question as a primate, not as a metastasis. It usually is having this connection. As we said, cranial comes from the pharynx up, so it can be. And biologically, is there. Can they turn malignant? Of course. So we have to stop thinking of cranial as benign. We have to stop thinking of meningioma as benign. And the brain, there's nothing called benign. All are aggressive, all can be fatal if you don't treat them well. So they can turn malignant, and this is Histologically proven. Leave them there for a long time, like the theory of uh, anitiomus and Sheikh Tutorala. Chronicity is one of the causes of, of the tumors. So, any tumor that you leave, <coughs> observe, control, it will turn malignant. Malignant. 23 cases in literature. Again, malignant kind of angiomas from USA. So I'll come now to the personal series of mine about kind of in general about recurrent cases. Are they common? They're not. In USA, which is about 300, 350 millions now, you will get 120 cases per year for the whole of the United States. So an average neurosurgeon will operate, maybe or may be able to operate on one kind of angioma every two to three years. <laughs> So anybody who has a collection of 20 or 30 is lucky. I was the luckiest of all. I have 102 cases because I accept the challenge of treating these cases that are referred to me from the Arab world, mostly in children and the disasters that they have giant size. Solid, 38. Mixed, 52. Simple cystic, 13. Size of four or above four is 74. And here they are. These are real giant cranial angiomas. That's why I have this collection, because I accept to take the risk and the challenge of treating these cases, not to be a mediocre man, mediocre surgeon doing biopsy and everything. For all patients, we do ophthalmological assessment, pre and post op, including everything. Visual acuity, uh, color, uh, fundoscopy, uh, visual fields, and then uh, optical OCT. And this is an example of before treatment and after treatment where the visual fields opened. And we use the German way of uh, assessing visual fields and acuity. We also do the psychoanalysis, especially for kids and adults. 
And because you are operating in the anterior and communicating complex in the hypothalamus, and you need to do the Karnofsky performance scale. Surgery, for these cases, you can use, I use different methods, but I love either the terrenal approach or the uh, transbasal approach. Look at this, okay, uh, optic nerve, nerve chiasm, tract, tract, and the tumor presenting itself through the laminar terminalis. And at the end, you can see the liliquous membrane and you can see the basilar artery and you have preserved the pituitary stoke. Do we preserve the pituitary stoke in all cases? I do my best. But if the pituitary stoke is tumorous, I do not hesitate for a second in excising it. The largest craniopharyngioma ever, Hiroshima and Nagasaki of craniopharyngiomas. Five-year-old with this tumor extending from the floor of the fourth till from a magnum. All this. A huge tumor before and after surgery. Oh, you damage the hypothalamus. No, you damage the hypothalamus because you are ignorant. Because you will do small biopsy and give radiotherapy. The tumor is there, it will damage the hypothalamus. Radiation is going to damage the hypothalamus. Kurdistani uh, child, 98, skiing in Kurdistan. Lady from Libya with this huge thing, almost lost her vision. Complete cure. But there's no floor of the hypothalamus. No floor of the third ventricle. Hypothalamus is pushed away. Uh, this man from, I think, Yemen, with this tumor and postoperative. And this tumor here from Sudan, I believe, yes, and his postoperative. So it's not one case I'm, I'm bragging about. This is philosophy. This is a school of thought, which I learned, and I'm keeping it. Uh, this 24-year-old, uh, this is recent. Uh, look at this extensive cranial for injury. Look at this. So we operate upon him. And it was really stuck to the optic apparatus. So that's why I chose to give him uh, radiotherapy. Is it right, Dr. Sami? Yeah, you have given him radiotherapy recently, but post operatively. If you feel that they are stuck, better give radiotherapy immediately. And this is him. Uh, and again, this is the story of my life. This little boy of three. In 2000, medical relaxation, no radiotherapy, no Omaya reservoir, no nonsense, and 20 years later. Let's see one film of how we do surgery for a fresh case, and then we'll see how to do surgery for a recurrent case. This is the last case that I mentioned. A 24 year old man with this extensive uh, tumor. We are in between the two optic nerves. This fluid is nothing. The mediocre surgeon would be then looking at his assistant. You see, we did decompression of the optic nerves. Surgery is done. This is ridiculous. This is a crime. This fluid is nothing. You need to remove the capsule, which is causing this disclamation as well. One comment about the fluid. Yeah. I mean, in the fluid, if the surgeon is really not aware, you look like pus. Absolutely. Because the squamous cells, when they generate, they cross this. They look like pus. Yes. So he will have an impression to the pathologist that we have done an absence. Yes. And this is very important to compare to the, the neurosurgeon. Not everything that uh, looks like a pus is a pus. Absolutely. So this is the left optic nerve, the right optic nerve is there, the chasm is here, the tumor is here, and it is here, and it is everywhere. You have to attack it, every aspect, because this is a 24-year-old man. His destiny is in your hands. His future is in your hands. If he's your child, if he's your daughter or 
son, you would love that the surgeon there do his best and not to be coward and ignorant and just take the fluid out and then send for the therapy. When I was operating, the father and the mother is in my mind, they are waiting outside, counting the minutes and seconds, waiting for, for some news about their child. You have to give them good news by being persistent, by being really educated. So this is the this is the bread and butter. This is the capsule with you that I'm after, not the fluid. By putting on my reservoir, they are just evacuating on the fluid, and the the tube is going to clog by this thick secretion. Revision of my reservoir, shunt, revision of shunt, and so on and so forth. This is the carotid here on the left side. So this tumor is really adherent, more adherent than usual. Now, I'm not going to be courageous on the expense of the patient. If I find that radical excision is going to damage my patient, I'm still. But I'm there. I'm aggressive. I want to remove every iron of it. This is a fight between me and the monster. And I have to win for the sake of the patient. Here is the stalk, adherent to the stalk. Easy to cut it, no. If I can take the tumor off the stalk, I would do that, especially in a child. And this is a disease of children. So optic nerve, optic nerve, chiasm, I am in between, I found the stalk and I want to remove the tumor. It's a giant tumor, you have seen the images. And he actually when he came, his vision was lost in the left eye. Now, after surgery, it's improving. Is it not, Sammy? Yeah, yeah. It is improving after surgery. This is what they leave behind after evacuation of the cyst. They have done nothing. The stupid mentor would be looking in the theater and say to his residency, see, we have decompressed the nerves, it's enough. I hope the residents are listening and I hope that they will recognize their stupid mentors. So those kinds of residents won't bother to educate themselves by Absolutely. Now it is the tumor that is attached to the stalk. I'm trying to remove every eye of it if I can. If the stalk is tumorous, I, I excise it. But if it is attached, I try my best to preserve it. Okay. I think the message is clear. Yes. So what's the morbidity in my series of those cases? I have my share of complications because if I'm doing surgery, I would have complications. Most of the complications are subdural hydroma and hydrocephalus. Again, hydrocephalus is for the same reason why the metastasis through CSF. These are my complications and numbers. And I always refer to this uh, psychological symptoms. These patients after surgery, they see objects, they imagine objects, and they talk to them. You go away, go, go, seeing animals, and mostly green elephants and green monkeys. Two mortalities, two patients died in my hands after surgery, and when we say surgical mortality, it is the first day, the first week, the first month. 
any mortality within the first month is per operative mortality. One patient I inherited from another Arab country who had surgery, but it was recurred, it did not recur. Uh, so the tumor is still the same. We removed it completely. He died on the seventh hospital day. Obesity. Obesity is a problem in clinical injuries. Everybody is afraid of obesity. You may have the obesity preoperative. So the classical teaching for medical students, if you see a young intelligent child, eight, 10 years, who is blonde and intelligent, think of clinical injury. So they can be obese preoperative because of the lesion itself. Postoperative, if they develop obesity, usually it will subside, especially if you do radical excision. So this is before, this is not mine, this is before surgery. I think she was 20 years old and now she's 32. So obese. In my series, I found that obesity happens in children in the first six months, one year, and then it gradually disappear. This child, obese, obese, and then obesity started to disappear. So I'm not afraid of obesity to achieve radical excision. In fact, I tell the parents, listen, I want to go in and remove the tumor completely. You will see that your child will get obese, but it will recover on its own. This, this little girl, obese, and then back. No recurrence. And there's no floor of the hypothalamus. It is there, but it's pushed. So different children getting the bees and then disappears. I did not notice this in adults. Adults do not show this obesity at all, in spite of doing radical excision. So what is the recurrence in my cases? And those when I did total radical excision, which is 84, mind you, 84 out of 102. It's a big number, but why did I fail? Because I couldn't. The recurrence was 11. While in those I did subtotal resection, the recurrence was higher. So I classify these cases. These are the cases which recurred, the collection. I classify them into my personal cases, which I did and they recurred, or the cases that was referred from other uh, centers. Again, remember that this is not recurrence. This is a stupid, mediocre surgeon taking just a small piece and send the patient to the therapy. So the recurrent cases from other centers, nine-year-old, beautiful boy with this tumor. What did they do at St. Elsewhere? We don't want to name hospitals. Shunt. Damage the brain, shunt, sent for radiotherapy. What more disasters do you want? So he was referred here to Jordan for radio surgery or radiotherapy. We did not accept this. We cannot give this radiation at all. So we went in and removed the tumor completely. And here he is after follow-up. That's the boy. If this was my child, I would love to be uh, referring him to a neurosurgeon, not a mediocre resident or surgeon. 25-year-old male patient, clinotomy, shunt, shunt for this. They evacuated the cyst, they put the shunt, hooray, hooray. We did radical excision for now, he's well. Lady from Bahrain, 73-year-old lady, went in, ah, uh, residual, uh, recurrent. No, it was residual, it was not done properly. And on doing this, they caused damage to the internal carotid artery, causing aneurysm. So she was actually referring for aneurysm obliteration, not for surgery. We closed the aneurysm and we took the tumor out. Again, 25 year old patient with this tumor extending from foramen of Monroe till foramen magnum. They attempted surgery but failed. So, this is the redo surgery, still 
Optic nerve, optic nerve can has metallic curve developed in middle cerebral and tumor cerebral basilar artery. You can see the coloration of the tissues not uh, virgin. The cases in my series. The cases in my series where I've done radical excision and they recurred. So this is a young girl of three. I removed the tumor completely in 2005. She came from West Bank, from Palestine. She was lost for follow-up 2007. After two years, she came with this huge recurrence. How come? I have done radical excision. <coughs> this is the challenge, that when you do radical excision, they may come back again. So what about if you leave something? So what do you do? Radiotherapy, gamma knife? No, you go again and remove the tumor, which we did. And this is her follow-up. And look at her, beautiful young lady. 61-year-old man from Jordan with this tumor, which I removed completely. And that's him. Three years later, recurrence. Radiotherapy? No. Surgery, and we followed him, and he's doing well. Uh, this is boy from Syria, giant cranial pharyngioma. We did radical excision. And um, three years later, recurrence, radical excision. And here he is. This is from Sudan, this girl, uh, eight year old. I operated upon her in the year 2000. Radical excision, 2002, still going, doing well. 2004, recurrence. What should I do? Radical excision again. 2008, major recurrence. I offered third surgery, the family refused. Another patient with this tumor and you can see Shant. This is from Sudan. Shant. And Shant for one ventricle, the other ventricle is still dilated. But this is what they know. This is what they were trained to do, a shunt, which is a stupid surgery to do. We did radical excision. Four years later, recurrence. And what did we do? We did excision. I will show you the film. Okay. So now we'll see a film for redo, for recurrent case. You would say, oh, adhesions and so on and so forth. It is difficult to start with. So what about redo? It is going to be hell. Yes, it's going to be hell, but you have to preserve. So here we are trying to remove the adhesions, identify structures. Indeed, there are a lot of adhesions, but by being perseverant, you will remove the tumor. Again, this is the chiasm, the tract. We are going into the lamina terminalis, which is the anterior wall of the third ventricle. So here you can see that the stroke is tumorous. I don't hesitate, I remove it. Especially when I have a good endocrinologist with me, like Dr. Mohammed Juma, I have no fear of good management. It is a group of people. This patient was operated upon here in, in Farah Hospital. And with good anesthetist who knows well what's happening, with good endocrinologist with me, I have no fear of operating on these patients. So I thank Dr. Mohammed Juma and Dr. Abouisha. But this is a challenge of this child from Sudan. So you can find a plane of cleavage, but if you don't want to learn, don't be stupid and refer for radiotherapy without trying to remove the tumor. So most of the time you will find a good plane of cleavage, even in recurrent cases. This is the basilar artery now. Okay, so the message here is that even if you have recurrence, surgery is much, much better than doing anything. Leave radiotherapy as a palliative treatment to the end. If in cases that I've seen, it is stuck, and I'm feeling that it may recur, I would refer for radiotherapy. 
So this is the final post-operative. And this is the beautiful child from Sudan. So are there criteria for recurrence? What are the cases that occur? There are factors that affect the recurrence. Adamantinoma, the recurrent rate is much higher than in papillary type. Papillary type is in the adults, adamantinoma in children. So recurrence in children is higher. Brain invasion, sometimes really they are invading. Incomplete surgical excision, like we see in mediocre surgery. Tumor size large is another cause and high KI-67. These are the criteria for recurrence, but the anatomy and the extent of the tumor dictates the approach of excision. And with this, I finish and I thank you. Any questions, comments, please? Uh, so, um, uh, to re-emphasize the point, uh, first, the injection uh, of the craniopharyngeomacite. Now, when you look at the injection literature of craniopharyngeoma, you have to always to bear in mind that by injecting, you have to, you are exiting the cyst, emptying the cyst, and then following up and injecting something that probably does not work. And when you look at stability of something over the least of time, you always have to remember that you are actually evacuating the cyst uh, regularly and therefore um, uh, spuriously uh, uh, controlling the tumor by, by evacuating it regularly. You're actually not doing anything to the tumor itself. Um, the second point is emphasizing that there's absolutely nothing benign about a benign, a benign brain tumor because it's the location of the brain tumor that's going to kill the patients. Uh, malignant transformation is extremely rare but the benign nature of the uh, uh, tumor itself is irrelevant given the uh, location and important structure. So there's really nothing benign about a benign uh, uh, brain lesion. Third thing, and we continue to hammer this point again and again, uh, radiosurgery, um, uh, stereotactic radiotherapy with no <coughs> tissue diagnosis and no attempt at complete excision, uh, is a crime, not only because the best uh, chance of controlling clinical pharyngioma from a medical oncological perspective is the first time around, and even at a current uh, clinical pharyngioma is the second time around, is because what you would miss by assuming that this is clinical pharyngioma from lesions that would have actually looked like clinical pharyngioma. So uh, missing things like pituitary adenomas uh, uh, without bothering to, 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 to treat them properly, Meningiomas, where the treatment of choice would have been uh, 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 surgery itself, uh, but germinomas, where the treatment would have been be that uh, secondary germinomas or primary seen as germ cell tumors, where the treatment after uh, obtaining the diagnosis would be curative, even if they're metastatic from elsewhere. And the mainstay would be platinum-based uh, chemotherapy with curative intent, even if this is seen as uh, metastasis. Histocytic sarcoma is not something to be missed in this location. Um, thank you. Now, uh, um, um, histocytosis is something that recurrently would happen on this site and would have been missed like that. Uh, lymphoma in this site be that as a secondary involvement by systemic lymphoma or as a primary involvement of CNS, which would be primary CNS lymphoma, which will be the reason why we continue hammering this every uh, uh, week is because the treatment is radically different. In this case, if it's primary, uh, the treatment of choice would be methotrexate at high enough doses to delay radiotherapy as much as possible. Sarcoid that would have been buried ev uh, as evidence uh, um, uh, 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 by radiotherapy, and then the patient would die in a mysterious manner because you missed uh, the plasma cytoma, where if it's truly primary, that there is no evidence of multiple myeloma in the bone marrow, et cetera, et cetera, uh, radiotherapy uh, would be at the treatment uh, of choice and would be curative uh, in most cases. Um, 
mats because nobody bothered to examine the patient properly. And by radiating the mat and forgetting the primary, uh, the patient would succumb to the disease. Uh, these are actual cases. This is not hypothetical scenarios. And those patients would have been labeled as penipharyngiomas and would have been subjective to surgical radiotherapy and then died in under mysterious circumstances. And, and that's not necessarily because of recurrence of the craniopharyngioma. It's because of uh, succumbing to a renal disease that was never diagnosed to study. Okay, okay. Any comments, any questions? Yes. First of all, thank you for your great presentation. Yeah, very beautiful work and uh, definitely to be added to that. Dr. Rami Danwaz is a neurosurgeon. He's from uh, West Bank, Palestine, and he trained here with us and he went also to China where he had further training. He's joining us for three, six months of training in skull based surgery. Yes, I have just only one question since you mentioned in your series the adults did not have obesity complication while the children uh, did. Why is that? I have no, I have no, no, no answer, answer to this. Yeah. I've been asked this question in every conference I go because my cases are the only cases where obesity issue is addressed. Nobody has mentioned this in the literature. So whenever I go, I present these cases and I'm a frequent presenter in clinical and drama sessions. The answer is, I don't know why. Hypothalamus is the same for a child or others. Please. I have, uh, regarding obesity, particularly in children, a lot of them, they do have coexistent adventose negligence and insulin resistance. It is not related to surgery per se. It is not related to the damage of hypothalamus, which control that. A lot of children, particularly in Sudanese, we had, we yes, had. definitely a contused negligence with insulin resistance. And those children, it is very difficult to treat, even without symptoms. Insulin resistance, it is very common. Uh, they tend to love sweets, carbohydrate, carbs, and uh, it is very difficult to reduce body weight. Thank you. Thank you. كعهدك دائما تعطينا الاجمل والاعرق في هذه الجراحه. شكرا. عندك كجراح رائد هل يخالجك احيانا الندر بانك كنت اول من احضر اليمنايف في هذا البلد فسهلت على المديوكر املها. <تصفيق> The flat answer, the flat answer that is yes, I feel guilty. Because when I was a part of this project, the answer was that we'll bring something that will take us the level up, i.e. good centers would have all kinds of modalities. So why should not we have the same? So I was under the impression that this is a scientific way of improving that is going to be used in certain purposes. And then people who financed this project wanted this machine to treat all the brain tumors. They just wanted money. They were not after scientific progress. So at the end of the day, it has fallen. Gamma life in general, in the whole world, has fallen in the hands of mediocre surgeons who do not know anything about surgery, and they would do and treat all cases with radiation. So yes, I feel good. See you next Thank you very much. في دكتور معكم كان بده في انيميا مش حكمة نص الليل دكتور مش كل بعض دكتور نص شو طلع طلع عندها نيرو بلاستون وسوبريني أنا عاد ضربت له يا رب خايف كل أنا خايف من شيء هلا 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 نيرو بلاست سوري إيش هو موجود Okay, can you hear me, Dr. Sabaya? Yes, I can. I can hear you. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Another excellent presentation. Well, clear, well illustrated. Uh, let, let's first go around with the panelists and meet them one by one. We sure. had 11 at one point, uh, but as you know, people come and go. Uh, sure. Marcos, Marco, could you please? Uh, 
I am a neurosurgeon from Italy, northern part of Italy. Uh, I, I appreciate a lot your presentation, John, and I appreciate a lot how you, uh, uh, you highlight the role of surgery that is still active and important for the uh, radio surgery and uh, even in this case when we talk about all about children uh, the role of surgery is in this case I guess uh, is mandatory so thank you very much for your presentation thank you very much thank you okay very good uh, we have a Abdullah Abdullah or Anas could you, do you have any comments or questions for Dr. Sabaya hi Abdullah Hello, John. Thank you Hello. so Welcome much. Welcome back. Welcome back. Th thank you so Hi. much. Uh, I listened to a fantastic presentation by Prof. Uh, it's nice. I actually posted a comment. I guess, um, uh, uh, Prof. John, you must have read the comment, but probably let me read it out. Uh, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for this expose and the fantastic results. The results have shown that nobody is infallible. Prof, sir, you are a bit too abusive in your language in the use of stupid and mediocre. Even the word experts that you mentioned in your presentation that emphasized complete excision must have tried other options that you typically condemned with strong sure. language. A senior of mine said that you can never be a hero in the field of medicine and neurosurgery. In particular, as everything is still evolving. That is why the emphasis on evidence-based uh, medicine now. So I enjoyed every aspect of your presentation and only wish to be an expert like you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I hope I'm, I'm not too strong in my language as well. I enjoyed no, every, and uh, some of us that are very junior in this field, uh, when you kept on using the word uh, stupid and mediocre, I was a bit thrown back that, uh, if we attempt anything that probably the result doesn't come out well, the condemnation will be too strong. Yeah, uh, yeah so I think I just say I should have that comment passed across. Thank you so Thank much you. for the presentation. Okay, Thank thanks you for your feedback. Comments. Abdullah, could you please introduce us? Where are you from and what do you okay. do, et cetera? Okay, yeah, yes, I am uh, uh, Abdullah Jimo. I am an associate professor of neurosurgery from Nigeria. I'm currently in Morocco, Rabat doing a um, fellowship in stereotaxy. Yes. Gamma knife and uh, <coughs> yeah. brain stimulation, functional neurosurgery generally. Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. Very good. Welcome. You're always welcome. Anas, do you have any comments or questions? Are you there, Anas? I saw you there a little while back. Let me unmute him. I think, uh, well, he may have stepped away. Well, uh, Dr. Mellum, are you there? Oh, there is Anas. Okay, go ahead, Anas. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Hello, Professor Ibrahim. Thank Hello. you for uh, uh, interesting. But I want to say that the word uh, stupid is a little word but because uh, there is a surgeon they did really a crime when uh, when the surgeon used the um, uh, shunt uh, to decompress the intracranial pressure without removal uh, the tumor tissue itself. That's it's really a crime on the word stupid is too little to describe Absolutely. this uh, procedure. Absolutely. I, I want to emphasize that uh, everything was wonderful on the results uh, revealed that uh, the skills is, um, is very, very, um, very uh, 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 proceeded. Uh, I have only one question. Uh, how can uh, the surgeon intraoperative uh, determine the pituitary stroke? Is this from color for the anatomy for the attachment to the chiasm? Uh, it seems though um, from the color. Right? Yeah, it's a very, various, various aspects. It's the anatomical knowledge of where is the stroke. Okay. You have read your images properly. You are not counting on the report of the radiologists. Uh -huh. You're counting your 
information of radiology yourself as a surgeon. So you determine where the stroke would be and you would look for it. You will see it, it's full of blood vessels, it is tubular, it's reddish in color, so you can discriminate it from the tumor. If it is cannot be discriminated, if it is really part of the tumor, then remove it, it's a tumor, it's no more a stroke. But if I, I can preserve it, I would preserve it, no doubt about that. I would go back to the question of the hydrocephalus. It is a crime that if you don't know to do cranopharyngioma uh, surgery, refer the cases for somebody who knows. There must be somebody in your department, in your country, in your city, who knows. Don't be selfish and don't be criminal and put a shunt. They say, oh, it was emergency in the middle of the night. I say, rubbish because you can put an external drain and save the patient's life until you send them to somewhere else. To put double shunt on both sides and connect them with my connection is a double crime. But this is practiced every day. And my duty in life is to expose these practices for the residents, for the mentors who teach them the wrong ideas and saying that we have decompressed the tumor, putting on my reservoir and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Okay, very good. We'll wrap it up now, Doctor. Uh, what's the topic next week, Dr. Abraham? Do you have I will, one yet? Uh, I, will, I will definitely tell you tomorrow because I have to look into the okay. availability of these subjects. But very good. Thank you very much, uh, for Dr. Pleasure. for presenting. Thank, you, Thank all the panelists Bye. for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay, we stopped. We're off the air. We're, we're on YouTube, actually. Uh, how you doing, Marco? I'm um, pretty fine, uh, John. Thank you. Uh, I'm very, very tired because it was a long, long week. Uh, that was, uh, you on call or something? Uh, no, today no, but I was in uh, in the last week uh, every day, so uh, it's rather quite hard, but very satisfying also. I perform uh, several cases uh, in uh, spine surgery uh, and uh, was uh, very satisfying. Uh, I'm also working uh, on some uh, papers uh, and um, I attempt to publish uh, one of the cases interesting about uh, primary melanoma spinal cord we operated okay. uh, and uh, with a review of cases. So I'm uh, very active in this period. <laughs> yeah, well, if you want to present it, you, you, you know, you, you're welcome to, if you want to present your paper online. Yeah. Uh, uh, you're gonna get a have a, a day. Uh, it could be Friday. After it's have to be published, right? You can't do it before, right? Okay, of course. You're right. Have you met Abdullah before, Marco? Uh, yeah, in uh, one of our last uh, panel, uh, I yes, remember Professor Abdullah. Yeah, Abdullah, you, uh, you're yeah, yeah. is it Nigeria from Nigeria. Yeah, in Morocco right now, right? Is it is it Morocco? Yes, that's right. Yes, a Nigerian uh, currently on fellowship in Morocco. That's right. Uh, that's right, Marco. Nice to see you again, Mister. It's, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Have you run across Nauru Bankol, a neurosurgical resident? I think he's. A, you're in Rabat. Are you in Rabat? Yes, I'm in Rabat. Uh, uh, I'm in Nar Rabat. Nauru Nauru Bankol. New Yes, that's right. Oh, he's, oh okay. He's there too, he's right? The, yes, he's here, but currently he's in a tour in, in France for a year, a year stage, a year rotation. A whole year? Yes. Wow. I felt like a fellowship, yeah. huh? Yeah, that's right. A fellowship. I, I, wow, so I, tours. That's a big anatomy place, right? A neuroanatomy place? That's right. Yes. Because uh, we had a, a telecast from tours. With Dr. Okay. Sherian and one of the neuroanatomists okay. from that area, they're pretty. Well, I guess their lab is really good or something. I don't know. Yeah. Have you have you been there before? Have no, you, no, no. Is tours known known as a neuroanatomy place? Uh, yes, um, a big uh, neurosurgery place he is, but uh, I'm getting that information from you now. The neuroanatomy. But he says a lot, a lot, a good thing, a lot of good things about uh, the practice uh, in tour. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Well, okay. Uh, all right, gentlemen, we'll wrap okay. this up.
and uh, you so you'll much. be here. We ha we have a. I don't know. If you guys are into spine, but we're mm -hmm. televising a spine conference from Pakistan for the next three days. So oh, okay. uh, the, take a look at the the, the Facebook. Uh, let, let me. What can I do? You know, we'll look at neurosurgical TV. It's going to be on the front page. The, okay, the, the, okay. Pac the Pakistan conference. If you want, okay. and look at the schedule. And maybe okay. you can see a, a talk or two that you like. All right. That would be nice. That'd okay. Be nice. Thank, thank you so much, John. Okay. okay, Marco. Thank you for coming. Okay. Thank you, okay. Abdullah. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.